Welcome to Slash Forward. In this film about Mary Shaw, we'll be examining the legend of Mary Shaw and how she, Mary Shaw, partook to create a multi-generational revenge curse in furtherance of the mystery of Mary Shaw. This is, of course, in reference to the film Dead Silence. If you seek to keep up to date on any news regarding Mary Shaw, please subscribe to the channel. Let's get to it. We open on ancient lore, describing ventriloquists as having demon bellies and adding an air of spookiness right off the bat. We then transition to an apartment where Jamie is victim to a plumbing mistake, only possible if someone poured water directly down the drain while he was under it, like an asshole. Since he has failed in his effort to be done by dinner, Lisa campaigns hard for some takeout. As she works to convince him, their undersink grab assery is interrupted by the doorbell. It appears a courier has left a large package for them. As they tear it open like it's Christmas, they find a bitchin' ventriloquist dummy inside, and it reminds Lisa of one of James's old ghost stories about an old lady who owned dolls? Eh, prob's not important. Despite this intriguing turn of events, Jamie has to head out to get their dinner, while Lisa sets up an epic couple's prank for later and takes a moment to play pregnant in the mirror, as ladies so often do. Things then get strange on us as the sound slowly begins to drain out of the scene. Only able to hear her own breath, she senses via a mother's intuition that this strange occurrence must be the result of the doll, but it turns out to have been the sheets the whole time, and they toss her far enough to cause some significant internal bleeding and then drag her back into the room. Jamie arrives home and finds portions of the apartment out of order, like the water left on the burner and the large quantity of blood on the floor, but Lisa calls out to him and sounds pretty normal, so he humors her by following her instructions to check out what's on the bed. Possibly expecting some sort of an epic prank, he ultimately finds out that it was she who was in the bed, and not elsewhere. We catch up with Jamie again at the police station, where Detective Lipton is playing his ass like a fiddle, sarcastically making like he doesn't believe Jamie killed his wife. But with all the evidence apparently against him and no good alibi, Jamie pulls out the big guns. In the town where I'm from, a ventriloquist dummy is a bad omen. It's kind of a local legend, and some people believe that the dummy brings death to those around them. You got him! Lipton's not convinced, but is also just feeling things out right now and he welcomes Jamie to leave of his own accord. Jamie, being a bit of a badass, hits him with a choice insult. Now give me more time to do your job for you. Come again? Now give me more time to do your job for you. What? Now give me more time to do your job for you. It'll give me more time to dig a job for you? First things first, some basic investigation and hey, that's the Lady of Legend. And this discovery sends Jamie on a collision course with his hometown, which is straight up dead. Except for his palatial boyhood home where he's warmly greeted by his new stepmommy, Ella. He finds his absentee father in dire straits, but with a new lease on life due to his recent stroke. But Jamie's a hard man and he rejects the olive branch, getting instead to the point and asking details about that popular poem about Mary Shaw. He needs to know why the townsfolk took it so seriously. But also, he has to get to work and make arrangements for the burial of his dead wife. In a strange town, she's never visited. So he heads to the mortuary where the crazy crow lady hangs out and he starts filling out some forms. He then finds a vacancy at a motel just outside town. Here, he makes a wise choice to sleep on top of the covers, but then goes face down into the pillow like an amateur. As he settles in, we take a tour of the ambient noise in the room and it slowly winds down. Jamie is awoken and has a clear vision of Mary Shaw herself, but he comes out of it unscathed. Back at the funeral home, Henry Walker receives Lisa's body and is aghast to find clear signs of the town's curse on her face. He then finds Marion hiding out in the crawl space, as she does, and runs her off to bed so he can get back to the task of trying to make the body presentable. Then they have a very beautiful gravesite service for Lisa, attended by Jamie and a handful of total strangers. As he unwinds with a sad walk through the woods, he is warned about the dangers of Mary Shaw. What's she talking about? Uh, you've already demonstrated that you know the whole poem, bro. As Marion wanders off, she mutters something about burying the dolls, as Jamie learns that Mary Shaw is not just legend. He grabs the doll, confirms its name is Billy, and takes him for a drive while Billy side-eyes the hell out of him. He arrives at the Misty Cemetery and finds a series of headstones with single names, marked with Mary's monogram. 
He digs up Billy's plot, and sure enough, the casket is empty. When the sounds around him stop, Jamie doesn't even hesitate, tossing Billy into the box and heading back to his car. He gets spooked by a shadowy figure that keeps buzzing his windows, and then has an encounter with Billy. But when he gets out to scope the sitch, there's nothing there. He jets back to his room so he can shower down, and emerges to find Billy's back, and Lipton's there as well. Unbeknownst to him, they had been engaged in sympathetic grooming together. He then presses Jamie about why he tried to bury Billy, a piece of evidence in a capital crime. Although, he didn't care about the doll before, and he's putting his fingerprints all over it now, so... Here we learn the story of Mary Shaw, again, the legend indicating that if you scream in her presence, you lose your tongue. Convenient, since that's what happened to Lisa. So you see, it's clear evidence that it wasn't Jamie. Lipton then absconds with Billy, sans respect for the chain of custody, and bunks down in the room next door. The night then passes without incident. The next morning, as Lipton steps out to find brunch, Jamie pops in to acquire Billy and takes him to the funeral home. Here, he confronts Marion, assuming her to be involved in some way, but Henry steps in instead, providing all the info he knows about the real Mary Shaw. We flash back to the town in better days, and discover she was one of the best, a legend in the field of ventriloquism. We're talking Jeff Dunham levels here, with a belly full of demon. After a show in which she threatened a child heckler, the heckler went missing, and Mary died shortly after. She left in her will a request that all 100 of her dummies be buried with her, and also that she be made into a doll, which really seems like a request you could just skip, no? Anyway, Henry walked in on that shit when he was a kid, resulting in a trauma we imagine to be fairly common to children who are raised in funeral homes. Afterward, he always had the sense that a chicken bone was lodged in his throat, and then also the town suffered a string of family annihilations. But the mystery remains, who sent the doll to Jamie? Henry let slip that Mary used to live in the theater. And I don't know if you know, but the Jamester is a bit of a badass. So he heads straight out there. You can only access it via boat. When he enters, he finds it full of your typical detritus and traverses the rickety catwalk, eventually finding himself in Mary's living quarters. As he examines her belongings, he comes across news clippings of a missing child who interestingly shares his surname. Then Mary pops out and almost gets him, but he holds strong. Meanwhile, Henry finds Billy and resolves to rebury him, but he's distracted from this task when he hears Marion weeping in the crawl space again. He goes in to search for her, but she's not there. When the door closes, he gets panicky, which is a bad spot to be in given the circumstances. Sure enough, he lets out a scream and we see Mary claim his tongue as her own. In this time, Jamie made it back to his father's house and demands answers in regards to the whole Mary Shaw situation. Turns out, the missing boy was Jamie's great uncle. When he went missing, they convicted Mary of his murder via mob justice, forcing her to scream and cutting out her tongue. The subsequent family murders were believed to be punishment for this sin, which is why Jamie got sent away as a boy. It was what they had to do to protect him, even if it caused irreparable psychological damage. As Jamie leaves, determined to end this, he's confronted by Lipton. He confirms he checked all the tiny caskets and found every last one of them to be empty. He's tired of these shenanigans and is now ready to arrest Jamie. But a call comes in from Henry claiming to have evidence that proves what's happening, and that he'd love to reveal it at the theater. And then the line goes dead. Too compelled to follow this lead, Jamie dips and runs, forcing Lipton to follow him to the theater. Jamie makes it across the water and enters the theater, following Henry's whispers, which guide him toward Mary's living quarters. Way more normal and reasonable than meeting him at the front door. Despite arriving well after, and spending some time looking for a boat, not knowing the layout of the theater or where Jamie would be, Lipton makes it to Mary's bedroom first, and then they both hear the whispers, so now they're partners. They find a hidden passage that they follow back to a cozy little workshop, where they uncover the secret location of the dolls. Plus, one extra doll that's actually Michael Ashen, made up like a Mary so that's cool. This confirms that Mary was prosecuted accurately, and likely got what she deserved. But she doesn't want to hear that, and the curse is still on. So there's the familiar winding down of the ambient sounds, meaning that it's time to plug up your pie holes, boys. The dolls all start looking at something, but not until they all finish glancing in that general direction do we also pan across, in an attempt to follow their gaze. It ends up being a lackadaisical clown, rocking gently and wishing she had some sweet tea. Jamie refers to it as Mary Shaw and asks her what she wants. She's most mostly driven by a desire to silence people and build the perfect doll. When he asks her why Lisa, a fair question, she insists on whispering the answer to him. When he comes in close, she reveals that he is the last of the Ashen line now that his seed, which had been sowed in Lisa's fertile garden, has been extinguished. And then she gives him a playful little lickety lick before revealing herself. The dolls then start getting all stretchy about the face, so Lipton begins stretching that trigger finger in an attempt to destroy all the dolls. Since he certainly doesn't have a hundred shells, they set fire 
under the expansive display case, and then realize there's one more they have to get to. So they run out, but the catwalk dumps them. Lipton lets out an instinctual yelp, which puts him on a roller coaster ride of a tongue removal. Jamie then takes the quick route down, but manages to keep his traps shut, eventually emerging from the water and swimming to shore. He races to the funeral home, where he finds Marion weeping in the basement, again, and she claims Mr. Ashen took the doll, despite the fact that he can't walk. He arrives home and the sound goes out again, but he finds Billy and dumps him in the fire, repelling Mary and her prodigious tongue. As he goes to his father, he discovers him to have been set up like a ventriloquist dummy, and then comes to the slow realization that the events that have transpired were the machinations of Ella, Mary's perfect doll, causing Jamie to scream out in anguish and ultimately sealing his fate. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch, and I'd like to take a moment to give a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. Dead Silence is a pretty good 2000s horror film that feels very much a product of the time. Unlike other entries of the era, it does well to stay away from excessive CGI, keeping it grounded and creating a genuinely creepy atmosphere. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.